Hi. After considering the issue of formulating research questions and looking at different study design options, both experimental and observational, <clears throat> we're now going to drill down uh, on the experimental side of randomized clinical trials and give you some examples of randomized studies that have been used to evaluate the effects of different types of psychotherapy, but they've also been used in pharmacotherapy research as well with people who have alcohol, drug, gambling, and tobacco problems. Uh, the question is, how do you select treatments to fit a population that you're interested in? Uh, one way to select treatment would be because you want to demonstrate clinical effectiveness. You know that treatment works for one type of patient, let's say marijuana users, uh, let's say it's just general counseling. Now you want to find out whether um, a particular variant of counseling known as cognitive behavioral therapy or motivational enhancement therapy or case management works better than just a couple of sessions of counseling. You also would select a treatment to evaluate based on its p potential for revealing effects with new populations in new settings or with new techniques. So that if you already know that, a, that counseling works, you may want to try uh, a new type of counseling compared to another type of counseling. Or you may want to look at whether it's been demonstrated in one population, say uh, adolescents, and now you want to find out whether it works with adults. Or if it's been demonstrated in males, you want to see whether it works for females. Another criterion for selecting treatments to evaluate is their applicability to an existing treatment system. Often a question arises about the cost of a particular treatment. So if you are um, using a therapeutic uh, drug like anabuse, uh, it may be expensive. And you may want to find out whether you could just do uh, with a type of outpatient treatment in the absence of giving people a drug to take every day. And that would be much less costly, but it would be more applicable to an existing treatment system that is cost conscious. You also want to find out uh, whether one treatment um, is distinctive enough from comparison treatments. So contingency management is a type of behavioral therapy that rewards people for good behavior. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy works with similar learning principles in a different way. And maybe that variation does not make them distinctive in terms of outcomes. And what you may want to do is randomize people to either one or the other to see if one is better. And finally, you just may want to do uh, select a treatment because you want to evaluate its feasibility for a more intensive trial in a pilot study. Here's an example of uh, a project that was done to evaluate the effectiveness of brief treatment for cannabis dependence. It's called the Marijuana Treatment Project, and it was done as a multi-site study uh, in three different cities in the United States, and 450 research participants who were chronic marijuana users were recruited from the community to participate. The main research questions were, number one, are brief treatments for cannabis dependence more effective than deferred treatment? This is basically uh, an effectiveness question 
when you're comparing no treatment with treatment. The hypothesis, obviously, is that brief treatment is better than no treatment. Second question is, uh, which types of brief treatment are the most effective? Here, you might be interested in varying the number of sessions that people are exposed to. In the case of MPT, uh, I'm sorry, MTP, the uh, comparison was between two sessions and nine sessions. And that was enough of a variation to expect that more intensive treatment would be more effective. Finally, you can do exploratory analyses to see if less treatment and more treatment are more effective with patients who have different characteristics, whether according to their gender or ethnicity or employment status. So we recruited 450 chronic marijuana users through advertising and referral in three cities in the United States. Once people saw the advertisement or were referred to the program, they were screened for eligibility. And in subsequent parts of this course, we'll show you the instruments that can be used to determine whether somebody is appropriate to be a participant in a particular study. In this case, obviously, we wanted to make sure that they were regular marijuana smokers. But we also wanted to make sure that they weren't using heroin or amphetamines or cocaine or addicted to alcohol or other drugs because that might mask the effects of the treatment when it's directed particularly at chronic marijuana smoking. So we were looking for pretty pure marijuana smokers. Once they met the eligibility criteria, they were enrolled and given informed consent. They had to be told that they were participating in a trial. They had to be told whether uh, they would be getting uh, one treatment or another, or be randomized to a waitlist control group. And they were told that if they needed help, if they're on a waitlist control group, that they certainly could apply for help and that would be offered. Uh, once they agreed to be randomized, they were assigned to the three conditions. And then uh, we did a baseline assessment. The baseline assessment took a couple of hours and it asked about their treatment history, their drug use history, their demographics, their personality factors, and a variety of other variables considered to be important in measuring uh, which patients respond to these treatments. After random assignment, uh, they wound up in the delayed treatment control condition, the brief treatment condition, and the extended treatment condition with follow-ups conducted at four, nine, and 15 months. Here is a quick summary of the results of that study. What was found is that all three groups were similar in the primary outcome measure at baseline. At baseline, they were smoking marijuana about 90% of the days during uh, the prior uh, three months. For the delayed treatment control group shown in red, uh, after uh, four months when they were followed up, they were smoking about the same amount, about 85% of the days that, they, uh, 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 that had passed since they were recruited. The second group received two treatments uh, of, of uh, motivational enhancement therapy. And you can see they went from about 90% uh, days smoking marijuana down to about 60%. And that was a statistically significant reduction in their overall or average marijuana smoking. And when they were followed at nine months and 15 months, uh, they continued to function at that reduced rate on average. Now, many of those patients actually abstained, whereas others just reduced the amount of smoking. But either way, they differed significantly, at least at the four-month point, from the delayed treatment comparison group. The third group, after four months, was 
uh, well into their treatment, but they hadn't finished the nine sessions. But they seem to have improved even more than the brief treatment group. And at that point, at four months, they were smoking about 30 percent uh, of the days instead of 90 percent of the days. And those treatment gains were maintained out to 15 months. So here we have an example of a randomized trial using a measurable outcome that um, has an untreated control group, at least for the first three months, because at three months, for ethical reasons, people were assigned to one of the uh, or the other treatments. Uh, and this provides very strong evidence for the efficacy of brief treatments, both two sessions and nine sessions for people with marijuana problems. In summary, randomized clinical trials are appropriate for evaluating whether one intervention is better than no intervention. And MTP is a good example of that. They're also good for comparative effectiveness studies and treatment matching. And in the next lecture, we're going to talk about a treatment matching study.